In 1889, when the automobile was hardly more than a passing novelty, the idea of holding a car race round France, starting in Paris in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower, was optimistic to say the least. But more than a hundred years later, as the competitors gather by the fountains of the Trocadero, it appears that optimism was well founded and the event, now called Tour Auto, in order to avoid any confusion with some kind of bicycle race, is one of the most significant classic car gatherings in the world. A rolling museum which embraces some of the most historic names in motoring history on an entry list that consistently tops 200 cars. Porsche, GT40, Cobra, Matra, Jaguar and, of course, Ferrari. More than 40 of those and half of those entries begin with the numbers 250. It was just over 10 years ago that this became an event for historic cars and in order to take part, a car must be of a model which had been entered between 1951 and 1973 and it cannot be modified or altered from that original specification. That's a very rigorous set of criteria, but it nevertheless provides for an interestingly and entertainingly broad spectrum of cars. There's so much to look at and every car has a history and a character worthy of scrutiny. But it's not just a rolling museum. The Tour Auto is also a hugely enjoyable social occasion, a long drawn out gastronomic parade through some of the most beautiful scenery in Europe, punctuated by moments of intense excitement behind the wheel. Because we discover the regions of France, new, even for us, and in plus, there is also a sportive side, sportive with des épreuves de vitesse, very interesting, and a plateau, a plateau of voitures, also, lui aussi, extraordinary. Some of the cars do have a fair history of their own. This is one of several Carrera 6 entries with a racetrack CV that includes a second in class at the Daytona 24 hours in 1966. Alors la raison pour laquelle ben, je, je, je reviens euh, plus, depuis plusieurs années au Tour, au tour Auto, c'est que évidemment il euh, y a les courses, il y a les amis que l'on retrouve chaque année et avec qui on, on passe un moment euh, agréable à s'amuser, à faire les, les circuits euh, et découvrir euh, la France en fait. Parce que grâce aux routes du Tour de France, on va dans des coins où on n'aurait pas imaginé aller soi-même, tout seul. In order to allow such a disparity of cars to compete together with some kind of meaning, there have to be regulations. And the first of these is that cars built after 1965 are eligible to take part but cannot compete for the overall victory. So neither the Ferrari nor the Alfa can take that overall win. But of the five GT40s on the entry list, there are three from 1965 itself. So there's a good chance that last year's win for the brutally pretty Ferrari backers can be repeated. But there are plenty of cars with character here. We'll come back to Matra later, but what about the pretty Renault-powered Alpines, of which there are half a dozen here this week? One of them driven, as we saw, by rally driver Jean Ragnotti. It's a combination which ought to provide spectators on the closed road sections and the racetracks with considerable excitement. And the entries for the event don't come just from France. There's always been a good transatlantic following and the presence of a French entered Corvette will probably give the dozen or so American and crews on the event something to smile at. Big horsepower and small roads make uneasy companions. Donc comme je vous ai dit tout à l'heure, mon retour au tour auto était uniquement conditionné par le choix de courir en compétition et non plus en régularité et je l'ai fait grâce grâce à la compréhension de Jean-Marie Beltest qui m'a loué cette superbe voiture, cette Corvette 69 de 500 chevaux. Donc Jean-Marie Beltest est aujourd'hui un, euh, euh, un des principaux team managers en France de voitures historiques. Il a plusieurs voitures dans son garage, dans son écurie, euh, Atlantic Racing et Jean-Marie Beltest, euh, passionné, fait aussi la course avec nous. But not all the cars are taking part in the hunt for all-out victory in the competition section of the event. Aside from the several classes into which the cars are separated, there are two categories which entrants can choose to be part of. The first is the regularity section, which need not necessarily be sedate, 
but which allows the competitors to proceed at their own pace. That said, it's a busy schedule for the next five days on a route which now heads southwards from Paris through Dijon, turning west towards Vichy and on towards the sea at Cannes, stopping for special stages and at historic racetracks along the way. The competition section, those with start numbers under 150, have elected to be classified on sheer speed through the nine special stages and three racetracks which make up the event. The cars are divided into classes within the two main sections and there's also a formula based on age, class and engine which will create a weighted performance index result at the end. The British enter GT40 of Charles and Mountford was last year's winner and so starts this year with the number one on its door at the head of a brief GT40 procession. The first three cars off the ramp, all 65 build, and therefore all eligible for the overall win. As the latest possible model year of a car that was a formidable racetrack weapon in its heyday and remains a performance benchmark as well as an automotive icon, the GT40 and never was the reason for its naming so evident as when the car is knee-high to a crowd of pedestrians, the GT40 is on with a good chance of win. Both of those things, a previous winner as well, the low-slung Ford, bound to be the odds-on favourite, even without an upper age limit. The GT40 would be a hard car to beat in a straight fight, especially knowing that all of the special stages ahead are on smooth tarmac home territory for a circuit racer like this. Absent the age limit, you might prefer to bet on one of the later cars. The American Enter, number four, is 66, and there's even a 68 car as well. And to be fair, you'd be a brave man to pick out any other car, though there is a fair clutch of late model 250 Ferraris to choose from. And in among the more recognisable shapes and names, you may also spot something rather more unusual. Ligier, for example, or the single Matra on the event, a 69-650 carrying the number six plate. Back in 1970, in an attempt to raise the profile of the event, the entry list was thrown open to sports prototypes, and Matra was the only factory to take part, entering two of these cars. One was driven by Jean Todd, Patrick Depaille and Jean-Pierre Beltoise, the other by Pescarolo, Jabouy and Reeve. Unsurprisingly, they came first and second and won again the following year. Sadly, it's not eligible for that overall win this time and neither are the small group of Daytonas in the competition section. All from the early 70s, they include a number of cars which are historic in their own right, with scrutineering stickers from Le Mans in the year of their build when this elegant V12 coupe was Ferrari's front-engine swan song, built in defiance of the mid-engine trend established by Lamborghini almost a decade earlier with the fabulous Mura. They too have their own classification in which they can compete though. But cars with an individual history are everywhere you look today. The closed coupe version of the Cobra, which Carol Shelby built for Daytona, could quite possibly have beaten the early GT40s at Le Mans, which might well have been commercial suicide so Shelby wisely didn't try. But it could happen here, and we might get a feel for that by the end of day one. All but 400 kilometres long, it takes in one special stage and eight laps of the racetrack at Dijon, ahead of the overnight halt. After a three-hour drive south comes that first special stage, just over six kilometres in length, the first chance for crews in the competition section to let their cars off the leash. Observers, though, are posted along the road sections and hooliganism carries penalties, keeping racing on the circuits and the closed roads. And those sections are run to FIA regulations and the competition vehicles have to be prepared to FIA specification with all relevant safety equipment in place naturally enough. Being first on the road carries a small disadvantage in that the following drivers can use your rubber marks on the road to spot lines and the earliest necessary braking points, given similar cars, of course. And given the similarity between the first five, that's an obvious disadvantage to the defending champions, but the car was clearly going well and they were clearly already on course to keep their hands on the silverware. And of course the spectators are winners too because you really don't get to see a GT40 at full chat very often these days and especially not in this kind of surroundings. 
appearing to travel much more slowly than is really the case because of the long camera lenses. This was dramatic stuff for the people at the roadside, assaulting all the senses with sight, sound, smell and feel. The big V8s make the air vibrate. So far, it was indeed number one, uh, the fastest at three minutes and 54 seconds, but with the prototype Ligier already on the stage, that had now become the target time for everyone else to beat. Although you must remember that the late model cars and the prototypes still can't compete for the overall result. They do have their own classification in which to run, though. So along with the overall classification and the performance index, there is this class within a class. But the Ligier was already running behind the current leader, not quite a second a kilometre slower, but definitely not on the same pace as the leader. But quicker than the next pair of fast forwards, which were both well off the pace on this first stage of the event. So this was already looking good for the title defence, although quite clearly the crew had no idea how they were getting on. This is the first road stage among nine, with a total of about 60 kilometres involved in five days, making this just 10% of the road sections. Add in eight laps round three racetracks, and you can see that this is very early in the event. That's Jean Ragnotti on the line in the Alpine, Riding very high for a road setup. It looks as if the suspension is ready for gravel or he's expecting big bumps. The big Corvette already in the stage and looking like a handful. The combination of enormous horsepower and narrow lines isn't always what you'd wish for, but at least you know the driver's smiling, even if his passenger isn't. And he is very much a passenger. There was no pre-event recce permitted and pace notes are not allowed any more than extra navigation equipment. So no trips, no GPS, no nothing. So the driver's approaching it just as he, you and I see it with rudimentary information provided in the roadbook. Just 10 items of directional information to get you through six kilometers tells you it's not gonna be much help in attacking hard. Not that everyone is doing that. In the regularity section, the rules are somewhat different, the challenge very different, and quite frankly, much harder. It's 200 kilometers from stage one to race one on this first day of the Tour Auto, and while the final few cars are still negotiating that first special stage, the first competitors have had lunch and are already arriving at the complex circuit near Dijon, around which they will now race each other for eight laps. In order to make this possible, the two separate groups, competition and regularity, are now further broken down into manageable grids. Here on the first circuit they visit, this is done on the basis of one 10 minute practice session. The grid positions decided in the usual way, fastest at the front and so on, back down through the field. So these then are the fastest in race one. At the next circuit they visit, though, there will be time for practice, but grid position will be determined by the result of this race. Eight laps of this four and a quarter kilometre layout makes 32 kilometres in total, and the race is conducted under full FIA regulations, which means that only the driver can take part. And though this is racing and competition in this section can get quite fierce, all the drivers are aware of two important points. The first is that the cars they drive are not just expensive, but extremely rare. Bending them makes a nonsense of the old racers saying that there's nothing wrong with that you can't fix with a bucket full of money. Some of these cars might never get fixed if they get damaged, and it's important to bear that in mind at moments like this. The other thing is that the success of the Tour is founded on conviviality and a sense of fair play. Drivers are therefore requested to bear in mind the possibility that some people around them may not have the same amount of racetrack experience and take that into account, and also to drive with a safety margin, preventing damage to the cars around them. So, like the road sections and the special stages, the racetrack outings are also closely observed and any excess behaviour will attract time penalties 
and ultimately, if necessary, exclusion from the entire event. That said, the next sentence in the roadbook given to all competitors reads, in spite of the paragraph related to protests, the organizer's wish is to receive none. Arriving here after the special stage, the Entremont Ferrari 308 topped the timesheets with the 44 Porsche second, but the fastest car eligible for overall victory was in third place, a 1964 AC Cobra. And that put the defending champion here very much second, just as he was in this race, trailing the very pretty and very eligible 23 Ferrari driven by Peter Hardman. Luckily for the Ford crew, the Rari boys had an awful time on the special stage, 14 seconds slower than the GT40. So for Chris Childs, following him across the line at the chequered flag was more than good enough to ensure a place ahead of him on the timesheets at the end of the day. But of course, the racing here at Dijon wasn't over yet. This is the second grid of cars in the competition section, and it's interesting to see how the practice times have brought cars of similar age and type very together. OK, it's not a perfect match for the classes the cars were already separated into, but it's not bad, and it's a bit of a pat on the back for the classification and weighting system applied by the organisers. But importantly for the leadership battle, this grid includes the 289 Cobra, which had been third overall after stage one and was the fastest of the pre-65s, but he wasn't at the front of this race. As the cars settled down into a more or less steady race order, there was a Cobra at the front of the field, but not the 79 car. It was the pretty red 63 model, again highly eligible for overall glory, and only 10th quickest through that first special stage on the road. In terms of the overall win, that put him right behind the number one GT40, two seconds shy of the top spot and looking for better than 12 minutes 30 over eight laps in order to challenge the leader. But it was already clear that this race was being run at a much slower pace than the first one. In fact, this was a couple of seconds a lap off the pace of race one, all very much as expected and planned for, and something which would later be balanced in the weighted classifications. But in terms of outright performance, pace and results, this race wasn't going to upset the apple cart for the overall leaders. Especially not with the other threat, the number 79 Cobra, tucked back in fourth spot. That didn't stop everybody trying for a time, which was fun to watch as the big Cobra slid around the circuit, but he was 20 seconds down on the time set by the GT40 when the chequered flag dropped for a theoretical sixth place overall, with the other Cobra now 12th, almost 40 seconds adrift. So, right now, this was looking like a good day's work for the crew of number one. With one more race to go, things were now unlikely to change because the cars in grid three were, generally speaking, older or with smaller engine capacities, or both. So, although there were class wins at stake and though the weighted classifications at the end of the day and the event might well throw up a different result to the unmodified figures, the actual battle for overall event glory now looked to be resting firmly among a handful of cars and drivers who had already raced. But the classification system appeared to be working well as indeed did everything else, with a set of races which were eventful and exciting but also, largely speaking, well-behaved. The organisers had asked the drivers to behave like sportsmen, and that indeed seemed to be the case. Not always easy when you consider that even within each grid, there's a wide variety of cars with very different performance parameters. That means the drivers are having to deal with racing in a pack of cars which all have very different rates of acceleration and, most significantly, braking. And they may all handle rather differently in the corners, giving everybody a great deal to think about on top of everything else. But no changes at the top of the overall leaderboard from this one, despite a great performance from the Morgan, a good result and a good time, which made him 36th out of about 124 cars, and there were about 100 in the two supposedly quicker grids ahead of him.
40 odd kilometres of competitive driving, the bulk of it on the racetrack here in Dijon, and obviously this was a good time to give the cars the once over, a quick spanner check and a dip of all the levels before the overnight halt, more of a precaution than anything else. But for most people here this evening it was so far so good, especially for the Ligier crew, top of their class after good performances on the special stage and again here in Dijon. C'est une très très bonne journée avec une grosse bagarre dans la course de côte aujourd'hui. On a réussi à faire passer les chevaux, je pense que nous finissons quatrième ou cinquième de la course de côte. Et sur Dijon, nous faisons en qualification sixième, derrière un gros paquet d'anglais et d'allemands, puisque les anglais tenaient la première ligne, et on finit en troisième position. Nous avons battu les allemands et un anglais, avec beaucoup de plaisir. As the cars are locked away for the night, so the crews can relax a bit, swap stories of their day and take the opportunity to adjust their own fluid levels. Lunch stops are organised on each day, but no alcohol is provided there for obvious reasons. Now, though, the crews are invited to visit the champagne tent, thoughtfully provided for the purpose, and later will enjoy a gastronomic feast, the like of which has never been a feature of a mid-rally overnight halt on any other kind of event. But everyone must be aware that this was an easy introduction to the tour and it gets harder from tomorrow onwards. It's 400 kilometres from Dijon to Vichy with three special stages along the way. None of them long, but all of them can be interesting, especially when you're driving without the benefit of pace notes and dealing with road features, more or less as they appear in your windscreen. This was the first of the three, almost nine kilometres long, and the number one car running first on the road made good time although the narrow hairpins made life difficult for cars like this, engineered for a racetrack environment, where a narrow turning circle does not figure terrifically high up the ladder of must-have features, leaving the drivers today to adopt rally driving techniques wherever possible, although grabbing the handbrake in a GT40 is not a driving technique which comes highly recommended. But you need commitment, that's for sure, and you also need a boot full of right foot. In the absence of any such technique, this hairpin in particular turned out to be a handful of its own and the crew of the number three GT40 were not the only ones to find it something of a challenge. Nor to experience the frustrating loss of time when the engine stalled to compound the felony. In fact, today's opening stage definitely seemed to favour road cars, although as the front end of the leaderboard filled up with Porsches, the front engine Ferraris also seemed to find their extra millimetres of length militated against them. This must all have been hard work in a car built by a man who scorned power brakes. But for Jean Ragnotti and the little Alpine, this was a day to celebrate. The little car was built for exactly this and Ragnotti was clearly enjoying every second of it. And who wouldn't? But here was someone who very clearly wasn't having much fun. Once again, we can see the race cars struggling on the road stages where they're out of their environment and going faster to make up for it often leads to even more problems. Getting hot race engines restarted once they've stalled is a famously tricky operation, and on a special stage where every second does literally count, frustration levels can rise to unbelievable heights, and that's the start of a very vicious circle. No frustration here for Ragnotti, and just look at the way he throws it into the hairpin. And watch just how nicely it goes round. Set up for the corner with a very firm flick away from the turn, first to get it off balance, 
and then flicked in with an equally decisive action so that it uses its own momentum to skip round a much tighter turn than the steering might normally permit. You can see him do that on the onboard, very small but very firm movements of the wheel, just kicking it round. A good run from Ragnotti on the first stage and also from the Ferrari crew, which saw them third fastest. They're chasing victory in the post-65 class, remember. The third class of competition is the regularity section, where consistency rather than outright speed is the main objective, and teams are awarded points for each section rather than times. At the start of each special stage, they are shown two times, one fast and one slow, and have to nominate a time between the upper and lower limits which they think is how long it will take them to complete the stage. The penalty points are directly proportionate to the proximity of target time and actual time, and the high scores are therefore for accuracy rather than speed, so a crew can recall highest score in a road section by being the slowest car through the section, but closest to their own nominated time. It's day two of the Tour Auto and the competitors are nearing the end of a day with three competitive stages with a total of just over 20 kilometres. But these are narrow lanes that wind through the French countryside between Dijon and Vichy and they seem to suit last year's winner. The presence of the number eight Ferrari on the road announces the absence of the Ligier prototype. Fast while it was going but out of the running now because of an engine problem which opens up the leaderboard in the post-1965 category. That should all have been good news for Americans Chris McAllister and Bob Bishop, except that once again their 1966 GT40 stalled mid-hairpin, and this time resisted all attempts to get it fired up again on the spot, and appeared to be stuck in the middle of the stage, and the middle of the road as well. With cars starting the stage at one minute intervals, it had to be cleared out of the way fairly quickly, opening the road for the rest of the competitors and allowing the crew to work on it in relative calm. Danny Sullivan, a name known to more than a few race fans, nailed two fastest stage times in succession, the Porsche in its element, while the real race cars, like the Alpha here, once again struggled with the harsh environment they were never designed to tackle. The crew's doubtless looking to make up time on the next racetrack visit. Seventh on the second stage and then twelfth on the third. Not good for the pretty 23 Ferrari, also looking a little lost on a day when Sullivan and the Porsche were so strong. But what a good day for Carlos Cruz up from somewhere in the 40s on the overall leaderboard after day one to a place in the mid-20s by the end of three stages which clearly also suited the 914. It's really quite easy to see why the road cars are doing so well on these stages. But remember, just 20 kilometres of road today while tomorrow holds 25 kilometres on a racetrack so the distance is pretty much even out over the whole length of the tour and therefore the route doesn't really favour one type of car above another. 1600cc is all the little Alpine is packing but its fibreglass body weighs nothing and you can chuck it about like a go-kart. Which not everybody is here for. But when you get to the classic cars, like Ferraris of a certain age, you can't really blame the owners for not hurling them about the place, whether they're in the regularity section and taking it steady, or at the tail end of the competition class, from where it's easy to underestimate just how competitive some owners can be. Up at the sharp end, Christopher Childs and David Mountford were very firmly at the sharp end, leaders at the end of day two, after a good day's work in the cockpit of the GT40. Back on the road after a hard day's work on the engine, Chris McAllister was still convinced that the GT40 was indeed the right car for the job. It's a bit of a challenge in that it's a wide car, it's stiffly sprung, uh, but it goes like hell on the road, so it's, it's, the compromise is worth it. 
No compromise for Ragnotti, as we saw on the stages, and pretty much no prisoners either, though he may not have the blinding power of the GT40s and Ferraris at his disposal. He's made the pretty little Alpine jump around the road sections a bit today, and as a result, he's fifth on the leaderboard for the cars entered in the post-1965 section of the event. For the week, I hope. We have two days. Encore un peu, encore deux, trois jours. Mais non, la voiture marche normalement. Euh, donc, je, je, on, a, on a espoir que tout va bien. Ouais. With two of the high-profile prototype entries both missing, we've lost the Matra today as well as the Ligier. The ranks of those drivers who are here for a reason other than outright victory has been thinned considerably. But the pretty and historic Gordini 36 is still going strong. It's the 50th an, uh, anniversary yeah. of, the, of the winning of this car in 53. He win in 53 with Jean Berat, which is a French, very well-known French driver. And uh, we are here for the 50th uh, anniversary. And we know that we will not compete with Jean Berat, but we will arrive. I think we will arrive. That's the most important for us. Victory in the Tour is not always a matter of outstanding importance, as you may have guessed. This is one event in which it most definitely is not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game that counts. Although it is still motorsport and therefore competitive. In fact, it has been said that there are only two real sports, boxing and motor racing, and everything else is just a game. But for some people, just being here among a gathering of cars like this is good enough. Being part of a journey which will mix touring with racing and sightseeing with sociability, not to mention prodigiously long lunches and evening meals. That's what it's all about. Day three begins with eight laps of the fantastically pretty racetrack at Sherrard, followed by one special stage. With Charles and Mountford on top of the overall pile and Danny Sullivan blasting his way up to the top of the post-65 leaderboard yesterday, these eight laps could be vital to the outcome of both classes and Sullivan had done it again in his race, fastest man on track all day. But the biggest surprise of the morning came in this race and it came from the little baby Alain of Nick Four. This race alone was a giant killing act of biblical proportions as the 1600 twin cam was outgunned by half the cars around it. Yet the driver made brilliant use of all the legendary agility that was the gift of Colin Chapman's genius to hold off the 3.8 E-type that was walking right behind him and treading on his tail for all of the second half of the race. It got closer and closer with every passing lap and quite frankly the Lotus could hardly have been driven any quicker. But responding to pressure that's what happened, and in the course of escaping his pursuer, Nick Four elevated the Lotus almost to the very top of the day's timesheets. The Jaguar was just one second behind him for the whole of the final lap, but that's where it stayed. The pressure was on for the last few yards, and the big E-type, looking twice the size of the little fiberglass sports strip was chasing, quite simply couldn't squeeze enough power out of the final corner to get past. And as the chequered flag dropped, it was still one second behind. And when the stopwatch was checked, the Lotus was just two seconds slower over eight laps than Sullivan in the Porsche. A fantastic performance from car and driver. No surprises to be found from among the rest of the races, really, as the grids assembled one by one in the order they finished last time out in Dijon although there was still a similar 10-minute practice period first. It's a good circuit, Girard, pretty to look at, and a tricky one to master with lots of ups and downs as well as curves. And those downhill bends that push the front end are always a challenge, always demand a well-prepared car and a thoughtful driver. And prudence, as we have seen, is often the preferred option when there's so much more to be lost than there is to be gained. Nevertheless, on a crowded circuit, there are bound to be upsets. Luckily, there's usually lots of grass handy, and all that's lost is rather more time than you could possibly have hoped.
to make up. So winning this race is one thing, but it's time that counts, not the chequered flag. And when the times for this race were added to the mix, Damien Kohler, number 121, was just a couple of seconds behind the GT40 of Chris Charles, who'd taken the racetrack steadily, well aware of the perils that lie in wait for the overexcitable. But he was a whole 30 seconds adrift of the man he was really chasing, the runaway leader of the post-65s, Danny Sullivan. There were six more kilometres scheduled for the day, this time on a closed road special stage, but had actually been shortened to just over 5Ks. Chris Childs took another lump of time off his Ferrari rival in the number 23 car on this short stage, consolidating his position at the top of the overall leaderboard. Good work when other drivers in similar cars were still finding the roads a little narrower than they would have liked. But this view must be a daunting sight to Americans accustomed to the broad sweep of the blacktop highways that carve a much wider, straighter line across their native landscape. The Milos were well inside the overall top ten when the day began, but Sherard had not been kind and they were never going to get back the missing two minutes on a short stage like this, and Jean Ragnotti must have cursed his own enthusiasm here. A rookie mistake, but well recovered, but still a disappointment after things had gone so well for him on the circuit earlier on today. Tailenders in competition, like the Fiat, were more than a minute behind the front runners, and that gave the regularity drivers a good spread of time to aim at. They, you remember, are offered an upper and lower limit and choose themselves a target time somewhere between the two. That choice of times is arrived at from the times set by cars in the competitive section, and there was, therefore, plenty of choice. And it's not just a question of picking the slowest time and going for that. Driving behaviour in the stage is monitored, and there are penalties for sandbagging, which had not been happening up at the front of this field, where the GT40 drivers in particular all emerged from the stage wearing huge big smiles. Dry conditions, rough, rough finish to the tarmac, so plenty of grip for our tyres and an absolute dream of a stage really. It's a pity it was shortened from six kilometres to five kilometres because we'd have liked 40 kilometres of that. Behind the wheel of the LM, prettiest of the 250 series by far, Peter Hardman had grabbed four seconds from the leader at Sherrard, but lost it again on this short road section. I, I really enjoyed the stage this afternoon, actually. I don't know if we were very quick on it, but I enjoyed it. Um, it was dry, it was quite tight, a little bumpy, I suppose, but, you know, the car went well. Um, so hopefully it was good, I don't know yet. Evening of a 450 kilometre day, which brought the total road distance into four figures and the competitive stage distance to just on 100 kilometres. The special stage had all gone a bit pear shaped for Sullivan, and the Porsche lost 16 seconds to the number 40 Ferrari, which was second. But luckily, they had lost a minute at Sherrard, so Sullivan stayed top, and his margin was now up above one minute. Day four of the Tour Auto is a tough one. Three stages, and the first one is just up the road from the overnight halt. Straight up, 1,600 metres into ski country, where snow still adorns the French Alps. And the same applies to the next stage at Chamrousse as well. No, let caution be your watchword now, especially those of you in cars like this, with more horsepower than is good for you on a dry road. Huge fat tyres that slip on dry tarmac, and an all-up wait to make Naomi and Kate green with envy. It's a recipe for disaster if you don't take extra care, and this is the longest stage of the day, more than 10 kilometres, meaning that the more nimble cars might well be able to grab back a useful handful of time if the crews can judge just how hard to push and not push any harder. Danny Sullivan was still in go-for-it mode, and once again the Porsche was in the environment it was built for. 
dramatically quick point-to-point -point driving with little or no fuss, even on slippery roads. This was a well-moderated performance from Sullivan and well-judged too. Top of the pile by just a second over the 10 kilometers, he'd done just enough to stay on top of the post-65 leaderboard. Running just outside the top 10, the crew of the Daytona knew this was no time for heroics. And though we're concentrating on the battles at the front of the field, this is a good time to remember that this is a field of 200 with the same dramas for position being played out later across the leaderboard. Everything to play for, whether you are 9th or 29th, and for many drivers, there was plenty to gain from the well-judged push. But in general, most of them were taking these first two stages at a steady pace, concentrating on getting through them unscathed. Except perhaps Peter Hardman, who started the day looking at a 20-second gap between the Ferrari and the Ford and knew that he had to be on the pace now or settle for second. As for everyone else, there was a fine balance between on the pace and off the road. Even for those in the regularity section, keeping to target times was sometimes tricky. No problems if you happen to be a Stratos driver taking things easy, but sometimes a little exciting if you were wringing an Alpine by its neck. Even if it was just for the fun of it. But now the route swung away from the Alps and Monte Carlo rally country, dropping towards Nîmes and well below the snow line. Heading for the third and final test of the day, just six kilometres long. The crews with the bigger and more powerful cars could let them loose again. And once again started to record the faster times on the stage. Paul Natfield in the number nine Daytona continued to edge closer to the top 10 on that post 65 leaderboard, though he was minutes behind the actual leader. And yes, you're right, Danny Sullivan continued to nail the 911 in a display of road driving prowess that would doubtless have won him a drive with a serious rally team if he'd ever tried it. Not everyone had come here to win though, and for many of the crews, it was now a question of holding on for the finish in Cannes two days ahead. And to be fair, Finishing an event like this is still an achievement for a classic car. And it was the main ambition of a large percentage of those crews who set out from Paris three days ago. And as ever, the pre-champagne spanner checks were more important to some than to others. But even where the margin on the leaderboard is half a minute, there's no point taking chances probably 30 seconds behind now it's quite a lot so uh, we need we need some good luck I think um, I, I mean I don't we, we couldn't make it up by just driving because I think we're just too too evenly matched anyway so we just need a little bit of luck to uh, come our way With just two tests remaining on the final day, one race and one stage, 30 kilometers in all, Peter Hardman would be needing a pretty fair chunk of luck. Like, for example, eight laps of the rather wet circuit at Ledenol, 25 slippery kilometers, which put the GT40 at a distinct disadvantage to the agile Ferrari. Hardman got a good start. No, nope, make this a great start. And he nipped into the lead going into the first left-hander. But even he was having to take things easy, and it was pretty clear from the onboard that he was walking a tightrope. He needed time, huge big wadges of the stuff, and he was quicker than Chris Childs, but was he quick enough? And could he afford to go any faster when the penalties were so immediate and so severe? John Ragnotti had no such qualms. He was hunting Sullivan's scalp and had to beat the Porsche here on the circuit. More than two minutes behind on the leaderboard, he knew victory was not really an option, 
but beating Sullivan on the circuit was now a matter of pride for the cheerful rally hero. Pudman obligingly let the Porsche through as well, not wishing to lose time, scrapping for track position he didn't need, and he concentrated staying on the black stuff and letting everyone else have all the dramas which Chris Childs also nearly managed. But while he managed a neat recovery, Danny Sullivan had got other problems, serious ones, and all of a sudden Ragnotti's glorious charge had gained some very real meaning because he was more than a minute in front of the Ferrari which had held second spot on the overnight leaderboard and that made him class leader by more than 30 seconds with just one stage to go. Just five kilometres. And Chris Charles was just 15 seconds ahead of Peter Hardman in the Ferrari. No one had more to lose than Charles or more to gain than Hardman. But few people made any mistakes, though there were still some positions to be gained or lost. Some of the margins between cars were just a couple of seconds. Just about doable in five kilometres for anyone who wanted to take the risk. Peter Hardman tried as hard as he dared, but on the dry stage there was nothing between the Ferrari and the GT40 and he could only nibble a couple more seconds from the big Ford. Nothing could upset the serene performance of the leading regularity crew either, who'd collected only a few penalty points on the way to Cannes, where the finish line, the champagne and the celebrations awaited the many winners who were on their way to the warm sunshine of the Croisette. Though we've been following the dramas of the three main classes, there were many other classes represented in a field of 200 cars, better than half of which survived to the finish. Even the luckless Sullivan managed to limp through the final stage and make it to the end of a journey that had started five days and 2,000 kilometres earlier in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. And though they don't all get trophies, they're all winners in one way or another. It may have been fun, but it wasn't easy. Confirming what we've just seen, Chris Charles and David Mountford take a repeat win by a handful of seconds after 150 kilometres of competition, a similar margin to that enjoyed by Ragnotti in his last gasp effort that convincingly changed the face of this leaderboard and put a smile on all the others. Smiles too for Martin Sakari, who led the regularity section since that very first test, as indeed Chris Childs had topped the overall leaderboard all the way here. To be fair, this year we came really not expecting to win. I mean, we were sort of obviously hoping, but uh, having won last year, I thought, I mean, once in a lifetime was enough. And I thought a second year is just an absolute bonus, but it was a hell of a, hell of a tight fight. No problems for the regularity winners in five days, and they probably would have won the long distance award too if there was one all the way from Argentina. I'm really, I'm really happy. The weather, as you said, is, is beautiful. The people have been very nice in the last stages. Uh, the stages were really, really hard. And so we are very happy that, that we were able to win. Well, no matter how happy he might have been, few people could have been more pleased with their result than Jean Ragnotti, showing just what the little car is capable of especially in poor conditions. Très bon résultat. Très bon résultat. La semaine il a fait beau. Pour l'Alpine, il y a eu un peu de pluie, ça a été très bien pour le spectacle. Et non, nous sommes très contents. Allez.
So, after five days of driving through perfect scenery, on a journey punctuated by wonderful lunches, champagne sundowners and hugely indulgent dinners each evening, tonight, for a change, there will be, yes, a celebration dinner on a scale previously unimagined even on Tour Auto.